Greetings and welcome to the first forum event of the academic year. Uh, uh, I'm Albert Carnesale, the acting dean of the Kennedy School, and it's uh, my privilege to moderate tonight's panel and to introduce very briefly the panel and the speakers. Uh, this really is, often you say this is a distinguished group. Tonight it actually is true. This really is a distinguished uh, uh, group of uh, speakers, and so I have no intention to make uh, speeches myself. Western security and the changing Soviet Union. Uh, we've all been reading about both of those uh, subjects, and as many as you know, the, the nature of the change in the Soviet Union of the relations between our two countries is exemplified by the fact that uh, this weekend last, we have here at the Kennedy School 28 Soviet generals and admirals learning about defense policy making in a democracy. So the, the rate of change is just extraordinary. Our principal speaker tonight is General John Galvin. General Galvin has been Supreme Allied Commander, Europe, since 1987. For those of you that know the jargon of this field, that's SAC Ur. Also the Commander in Chief of US forces in Europe, SINC Ur a native of Wakefield, Massachusetts, so now you can figure out why he was willing to come here to be with us today, a graduate of West Point with a degree also from Columbia University in English and has taught English and spent a year in the area as a research fellow at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy but admitted earlier today <clears throat> that he really spent most of his time at Harvard. He probably thought that was in private and I wouldn't repeat it. A soldier scholar who's written three books, two of which were on the American Revolution and of one of which was on air assault, a modern book about strategy. Let me also introduce the panelists briefly. First, uh, they will speak in alphabetical order, the order in which they're seated. <laughs> Professor Madeleine Albright, the Donna Professor of International Affairs and Director of the Women in Foreign Service Program at Georgetown University. Madeline is also President of the Center for National Policy, a nonprofit research organization that examines domestic and international affairs issues. A graduate of Wellesley College with a PhD from Columbia University, an expert in international affairs and especially in East, the countries of Eastern and Central Europe. How many other people do you know that are fluent in Czech, French, Polish, Russian, and, as you will soon see, English? <laughs> Madeline not only has impressive uh, academic credentials, but has also been very much involved in the real world of government and politics, having served on the National Security Council during the Carter administration, served on the on Capitol Hill, uh, and uh, most recently was a senior foreign policy advisor to a well-known Democratic candidate from Massachusetts. Next, Ambassador Robert Blackwell. Bob is one of our own, lecturer in public policy here at the Kennedy School, a distinguished career as a foreign service officer. Most recently, before returning to the Kennedy School, as special assistant to President Bush, for European and Soviet affairs. But he's also served under other presidents and Secretary of State, Secretaries of State and worked directly for Henry Kissinger, Alexander Haig, and George Shultz. He's been posted in Kenya, London, and Tel Aviv. He too has written widely in this area and like General Galvin and Professor Albright, also has several books to his credit. And finally, Dr. Lawrence Korb, Larry Korb, director of the Center for Public Policy Education and a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Prior to joining Brookings, he was the dean of the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Pittsburgh and a vice president for corporate operations here in Raytheon. But before that, in the first Reagan administration, was the assistant secretary of defense 
for manpower, reserve affairs, installations, and logistics. That's a long title, doesn't sound very sexy, but it is 70% of the defense budget that goes into those areas. So uh, Larry Korb knows a lot about these subjects. PhD from the State University of New York at Albany, also several books in this domain. So we really have the subjects covered from the area of practice, people who have had real world experience in this field, as well as thinking about it at the highest intellectual levels one can imagine. Our format tonight is first General Galvin will speak and then brief remarks by each of the panelists and then we'll turn to questions from the floor. General Galvin. Thank you, Al. Al mentioned that I'm the sack cure and sink cure. Uh, somebody said the other day to me, I've read a lot of those books like Red Storm Rising. You're the saucer, aren't you? <laughs> so I'm also the saucer. Uh, I would like to just take a few minutes and talk about two things, really. Uh, where the Soviet military finds itself today, because I think you know very well where the Soviet Union finds itself. Uh, and then where do I think they'll go from there, and what should we do? And that will bring me back to my own job in NATO. But of course, part of my job is to keep track of the Soviet military, which I've been doing for quite a few years now, about uh, 13 years over in Europe, out of the last uh, 15 or 16. So let me start by saying that the Soviet military listened when Gorbachev told them back in 1985 that perestroika had to come in uh, because there wasn't any future for the Soviet military in the long run unless things changed, that the Soviet economy would not support the military as it moved along into the future technology and, and the area to come. I think that the Soviets thought Gorbachev, the military thought Gorbachev was right. They still think Gorbachev was right. They just didn't know how much it was going to hurt. Uh, so I had a good chance today to talk with the 28 uh, generals and admirals uh, who are here. Uh, and I'm very happy that uh, General Lobov, Vladimir Lobov, is the current, uh, he's the Colin Powell of the Soviet Union, and I hope he stays for a while. I don't know how this will go, uh, because uh, I know him very well. He was the former chief of the Warsaw Pact. And from uh, my impressions today, and from a lot of other impressions, I would say these things to you. Uh, first of all, the Soviets, in terms of arms control, had have tried very hard to, the military tried very hard to agree with the CFE Treaty as we've gone along, even though all kinds of other things, such as the Warsaw Treaty Organization, fell apart in the process of these negotiations, uh, so that it really, in the end, instead of being 16 NATO nations and seven Warsaw Pact nations, it was really uh, 16 NATO nations then only six Warsaw Pact nations because one of those had become another part of Germany and uh, all of those nations were really squared off against the Soviet Union. So right now the Soviets have uh, tried to react to that situation as it went along by moving equipment west, correction, like east of the Urals, they have about 50, 57,000 pieces of equipment there. Uh, they have done that because they really don't know how to manage all of the military equipment that they have and still work the arms control agreement. Uh, they also uh, don't uh, have a very good uh, control of their own uh, training and uh, operational levels because they are trying, they have moved out of Afghanistan as you know, they're trying to move out of Eastern, the eastern lender, the eastern five provinces of Germany. They still have about 250,000 
uh, troops in there, and they're moving thousands uh, per day out. Uh, but they really have no place to put them uh, back in the Soviet Union, no barracks, uh, and uh, they can't build fast enough to take care of that. Uh, they are looking at training problems and organization and problems that uh, really mean they have to change everything that they're doing. At the same time, they have watched what has happened in the Gulf War and have seen that their own ability to organize and utilize their forces, their technology, is not comparative to the West. So where do they go from here? The Soviet military is trying to learn from us. That's one of the reasons they're here at Harvard today. Uh, they, uh, they want to uh, try to have a smaller military, a military that is well supported technologically, but they have no idea where the Soviet economy is going, so they don't know uh, how much support they will have there. It is a situation for them of complete unpredictability. Uh, they are not uh, decided among themselves on what they need to do in terms of the things they've talked about to us, such as military reform, uh, sufficiency of the defense, uh, and uh, their ability to relate security concerns uh, to us in the West. What should we do about this? This is a, a situation of potential instability that is uh, really something we'd like to make uh, go away. We'd like to see all of this be more stable, more predictable, uh, less uncertain. I think that as we, as we look at that, what we need, at least in the near term, is the kind of structures and procedures and relationships that will provide us a greater stability than we have now as we look at where the Soviets are. In fact, it's, it's so, all of this is so confusing that it's hard to say whether they should be called the Soviets or the Russians or some other uh, new name. How to get that stability is really through structure and what structures we have right now we need to look at and see how they combine. Now, if you, uh, the most important thing for us, I think, in terms of the North Atlantic Alliance is the meeting that comes up in Rome in the first week of November, so it's only a short time off. In the, in the last meeting which took place at the summit, all of the heads of state coming together, which was in London in July of 1990, we said that as NATO, we recognized the world had changed and we needed to change. And so we said that we no longer considered the Warsaw Pact, which still existed then, or the former Warsaw Pact, as our adversaries. We didn't see adversaries. We thought the real danger was the danger of instability, and we felt that the NATO structure with a much reduced uh, military, but a structure that could tie in to the other structures of security in the world to include the European structures uh, such as the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, the European Community, the Western European Union, and of course uh, the United Nations, that we should tie NATO into this. This was uh, in fact uh, then re-emphasized in the ministerial meetings in Copenhagen this spring. And there is one item that I think is important that I'd like to uh, read to you word for word because I think it was missed uh, pretty much after that meeting. But we said in NATO at Copenhagen uh, in the communique, our own security is inseparably linked to that of all other states in Europe. Our common security can best be safeguarded through the further development of a network of interlocking institutions and relationships constituting a comprehensive architecture in which the alliance, the process of European integration, 
and the CSCE are key elements. I think you'll see in Rome that that will be emphasized, that will probably be taken farther than that statement, but what it says is that we need to ensure that the relationships for security in Western Europe, which are so important to us here, embrace also the security concerns of the Soviet Union and the Eastern European countries so that we don't look at our own defense and our own security without taking into account the concerns of those nations. Now, we will also, I think, uh, see a reduction in U.S. military forces in Europe down to uh, a level of about 150,000, maybe lower than that. Those forces uh, four years ago were at 326,000, so this will mean a reduction of more than half. Uh, and this brings up the question of our own United States strategy as we look at this situation in Europe and especially in the Soviet Union. Our strategy up to now has been, over the last 40 years, to show our commitment to Europe and to the stability in Europe by keeping forces there. This is not a flexible strategy. It doesn't allow us to make a decision as to whether or not we're involved if something happens in Europe. Uh, and you could say, well, why have uh, that kind of strategy? We saw that the first half of this century was a very bad half in terms of the war and destruction, and part of that reason uh, was that we could not help being drawn into war in Western Europe, but since there was no structure for the shaping of, the, of security in Western Europe, uh, we had no effect, we had no influence uh, on that. It is true now that with forces forward, we would be drawn into whatever happened. But it also gives us a seat at the table in Europe, and it gives us the ability to have influence in the way events go. And the new strategy of NATO is a strategy of crisis management in which we hope to be able to keep any crisis from moving toward war uh, by the stabilizing presence of the structure and the interrelationships that NATO can provide us. It gives us more, though, than just a seat at the table. Uh, the fact that all the forces in NATO, in the 16 countries, are integrated means that there is less of a problem of the renationalizing of forces so that, that each country would once again have its own national militaries. As it is now, these links of command and control are such that no nation has a complete uh, military force, but rather one nation may have it in its navy uh, large seagoing uh, ships uh, such as aircraft carriers, while others have coastal patrol ships. And this applies across the armies and air forces of those countries, of all of our NATO countries. So I think that as we look at the future, it is one in which what the most important thing to us will be stability. Uh, that doesn't fix us to the status quo. It means that we have to look at events as they come along, but strive to keep those events from getting unstable and resulting in conflict. And the way that we should try to do that is hold on to NATO, uh, reduce our forces but keep our commitment there and tie NATO into the other structures and definitely take into account uh, the Soviet Union and the security concerns and potential instabilities there. And I would stop at that point uh, and hand the floor back to you, Al. Thank you. Um, I will talk a little bit about um, what's happening and what has happened in Central and Eastern Europe. For an area that had complete clarity uh, by being dominated by the Warsaw Pact, it has now turned into area of maximum confusion in terms of its security. 
the nations of Central and Eastern Europe are in effect in a security vacuum or limbo, uh, whatever term you want to choose, because they are not at the moment under any kind of a security umbrella. Uh, and yet, if you take a look at your news, you know that they in effect are experiencing and will experience potentially the most destabilizing uh, possibilities in Europe, not to speak of what will happen to them as a result of potential changes in uh, <coughs> the Soviet former Union, as I call it. Um, I think that uh, basically they are confused because they don't understand the signals that have been sent out to them. Um, and they have traded this clarity of the Warsaw Pact for this sense of not knowing to whom they belong. One of the best visuals I ever uh, witnessed, and uh, as Al said, I witnessed some during a campaign, was when in June um, 1990, I was in Prague, and the Czechs had just returned from Moscow, where they, in effect, uh, had met uh, to talk about the Warsaw Pact. And as a result of rotation, they were in charge of the Secretariat. And the Foreign Minister, in a press conference, Made, he said, we have just come back with all the power of the Warsaw Pact. And he picked up a little felt bag. And out of it, he took two stamps, a rubber stamp and a round one. And he said, and now we have all the power of the Warsaw Pact. And here it is in Prague in this little bag. Now, the fact that he could make that kind of fun of it, I think, was a, a sign of things to come. And also of the fact that they were uh, having a wonderful time, euphoria at that stage. At this stage, euphoria has disappeared. And I think part of that has to do, as I said, with mixed signals. Uh, originally, if you go back through a lot of permutations here of how they have behaved since their revolutions of 1989, the, the Central and Eastern European countries were first more interested in some kind of neutrality and were, in effect, talking about beefing up CSCE. And at the same time, we were talking about the fact that we were going to hang on to NATO, but we really didn't want them as a part of it. And now they don't know what to do, because CSE has not been beefed up, and we are making it clear that we don't want them as formal members of NATO, and we might, in effect, extend some kind of an umbrella to them, but it is unclear. As you talk to them, they're not quite sure what that means. And they themselves, uh, if you, I happen to follow this probably more closely than most of you, uh, can see that on uh, the defense ministers of the country will say one thing on a given day, saying that they really want neutrality, while some of the other parts of a government are somewhere negotiating about the fact about having a closer relationship. I think that they don't know where they belong, and they're mainly concerned about being in a no man's land. Uh, and they obviously are concerned by the events in Yugoslavia without a real peacekeeping system to make it work. So they themselves are searching for institutions. They also ended up having quite a hard time with CFE. Uh, the question was how to divide things up. And in the course of that, some very interesting rivalries developed, and I think they're going to be worth watching. For instance, it was of some surprise that ultimately after Poland, which is the largest country, the Bulgarians had the largest number of tanks. And people wondered why they need them. Having recently come from Bulgaria, where uh, some high official said there are certain parts of our country that are in other countries, and if uh, <laughs> Macedonia, if the Serbians stand alone, we will go after Macedonia, uh, you begin to have some feeling about why they wanted some tanks. Also now, with the uh, falling apart of the Soviet former Union, what you have is how do the Baltics fit into the counting of the CFE. So I think uh, that has all added to the sense of unease. I know from the contacts that I've had is what they are interested in is to have training with the NATO military. They would like to have civilian control of their military. They're trying to figure out how to learn that. Um, and they would like to have uh, interchangeability of weapons. They also are going to have, especially Czechoslovakia, a very hard time dealing with conversion. Um, and when, maybe when we get into the Q's and A's, I think it's very evident that the issues of economic change, uh, rampant nationalism, and conversion in areas of potential unemployment creates very serious problems. So everything is coming together in Central and Eastern Europe. 
The additional point, I think, that needs to be made is originally the Warsaw Pact was built up on the basis of bilateral alliances that had been uh, set up after the Second World War friendship treaties. With the breakup of the Warsaw Pact, what has begun to happen is that the Soviets, in effect, wanted to re rebuild that bilateral alliance structure. And they sent draft treaties to the former satellites and, in effect, had in their clauses which said that their uh, land would not be used for stationing of forces from another unfriendly alliance. The Romanians, in fact, signed uh, something with similar language to that. The other nations have now refused, feeling that they are stronger. But clearly there is this attempt to develop a new web. I think that it's very important for the West to try to be very clear about uh, the problems in this area, that it is one which is currently no man's land, that has in effect very serious potential border clashes um, and uh, potential instability, that wants to be a part of the Western alliance system, and we have in effect sent mixed signals. We did not want them as a part of NATO because we didn't want to frighten the Soviets. I think that is a different issue now, and I think that clearly this is one of the things that needs to be discussed when people talk about what kind of a security structure uh, needs to be in place. My sense is that generally in Europe uh, and in Central and Eastern Europe specifically, we have what I call institution bind. The institutions that we have are not quite reflective of the needs that the new period uh, is presenting, and it's a, a period where we need to think very creatively. All the countries are now in co competition to be the favorite child of the EC or the Western European Union or NATO or whatever institution they're talking about. And therefore, this is very much a critical period. I have just come back from doing a long polling project uh, throughout Europe um, and in uh, Russia, Lithuania, and the Ukraine. What comes out of this is, frankly, that the United States is the most militaristic nation in the world, that uh, the others, including Russia, is, uh, according to polls, much less interested these are ordinary people. These are not uh, uh, the officers that we've been talking to uh, that feel that force was, is, should not be used and that they want to scale down their defense budget. And we, and I will just put this in and then I'd be delighted to talk more about this poll, but we polled back after the coup and we found the following thing out of uh, 1,035 residents in September of Moscow and St. Petersburg reveals that a solid majority of those questioned, 57 percent, are in favor of the re army remaining under some central authority rather than being divided among the republics, uh, and that um, they were coming under exclusive control of the Russian Republic. And even a larger majority, 63 percent, think that nuclear weapons should be controlled by central authorities rather than by Russia or the other republics. In Russia, they do favor having a Slavic confederation, and they do not want to have this all divided up. I think there are many questions about what this means for the military and for the nuclear weapons, and I hope we'll have a chance to talk about that. But I'd just like to conclude by saying that after the euphoria of 1989 and the pleasure that we all took with the wall coming down and the Warsaw Pact being disbanded, I think that we have now, in effect, left this area in which two world wars started without any kind of a functioning security system. Thank you, Madeline. Ambassador Blackwell? I agree with uh, Madeline's uh, analysis of the problems in Eastern Europe, but it does make one wonder uh, if things are so bad there now what would have happened if we'd lost rather than won the Cold War. Um, I have four points I'd like to make uh, about the consequences of the events in the Soviet Union, then a few words on NATO, and then some policy pres prescriptions. First, um, perhaps you're not having the problem I'm having in internalizing what happened in the former Soviet Union or the, or the uh, Soviet form, former Union or the U, you, you could go on. Um, I would try to vivify it like this. There's probably not a week uh, since 1945 uh, in which if you missed it, you missed more than that week after the coup failed. 
and I think uh, one way to reflect on this is to imagine historical events this century with as much weight as the second Ru Russian Revolution and the collapse of communism. It could be a parlor game that you can do uh, later at the uh, boathouse bar. Um, I have a long list, what I want, well, a list of eight or so. But just to give you their dimensions, I think that what's happened since the August Revolution is as important geopolitically, for instance, as the way World War I ended with the collapse of the four <coughs> empires and the Russian Revolution, or as important geopolitically as the Marshall Plan, the creation of NATO, and so forth. So uh, I think this is of enormous historical importance. Second, and I think it follows, or I guess this is third, uh, it cannot be so if these events in the Soviet Union are of that weight that our institutions are perfectly suited to deal with them. It cannot be so that the institutions which brought the West victory in the Cold War are precisely suited for a situation so radically different than the one we faced before August. Let me try to stress that by quickly uh, describing what NATO said it was, was its uh, four core security functions three months ago. Um, first, to prevent any country from achieving hegemony in Europe or to try to see to it that no country would be able to intimidate or coerce any other European country. Second, to serve as a forum for transatlantic consultation. Third, to deter and defend against any threat of aggression against the territory of NATO member states. And fourth, to preserve the strategic balance of Europe. The first principle, hegemony, seems overtaken by events. No successor state to the Soviet Union seems likely to have that capability for years and years. The second, calling for NATO as a transatlantic body of consultation is important, but as Madeleine implied, if most of the Western challenge has to do with economic problems in Eastern Europe and Soviet Union, it isn't clear that NATO is the best place to discuss and decide those. Third, the deter and defend language of principle three is, of course, an old NATO formula about an old Soviet Union that doesn't exist. And uh, if it applies at all now, it seems to apply uh, to perhaps attacks on Turkey from the Middle East or on France and Italy from across the Mediterranean. And uh, principle four, maintaining the stri strategic balance within Europe, one wonders what that is today. So on this point, I just conclude by saying, given the magnitude of these events, none of us understand now what their consequences are. And I only suggest that to you because it may slow your willingness to make big judgments now. Imagine yourself in a carriage on a bumpy road going from Nice to France in January of 1790, from Nice to Paris in January of 1790. And that may slow you down with regard to uh, the certainty of your judgments now. On NATO, I'll just say uh, two words, which were basically that uh, it is the most effective Western institution in the security area. And I would be cautious myself before throwing it away. Because then one has to ask, isn't the Europe without a NATO one which looks very much like the one which produced the two world wars? Finally, my own judgments about particular policy issues. US troops in Europe, yes but at a third their present size, maybe a core and two or three air wings. U.S. nuclear weapons in Europe, yes, 
but a few hundred, not several thousand, as is the case today. A freeze on strategic nuclear modernization, except defenses, yes. A freeze on modernization of short-range nuclear weapons, yes. And finally, I would say that if your view of these policy issues is unchanged by the events in the last month, it could be that that's because you are using an ideological optic to try to understand what's happening. Never has analysis been more important. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Bob. Dr. Korb. <clears throat> When all is said and done, you have to make uh, decisions about what kind of military you want to have for the United States to have the security, how much is it going to cost, and what arguments will you use to get the support of the, uh, the body politic uh, for the uh, type that you want and the expenditures. Now, let me begin by talking about the underlying principle that guided uh, everything we did in the Defense Department for the last 40 years. Every decision that you made, every weapon system you bought, the level of readiness uh, that you had for your troops, uh, where you deployed uh, your troops around the world was all guided by resisting Soviet communist ex expansionism. And the feeling was that if you could handle the Soviet Union, then you could handle any other contingency. To a certain extent, for people in the Pentagon, the world was a lesser included case of uh, NATO. I remember in my own uh, uh, military career when I was over in Vietnam, I was flying some of the most sophisticated anti-submarine warfare planes ever developed, counting junks, because we never built planes to go out and, and count junks. So it was very, very important to keep that, keep that in mind, that how much everything was driven. Now, this was an expensive strategy. It cost us about $8 trillion in today's dollars uh, between 1950 and, and, and 1990. But it was not burdensome. The percentage of the GNP uh, was never very high, and it's, it's, it's pretty low now. It's only about uh, five, a little over 5 percent. Nor was it burdensome in terms of uh, uh, getting a large percentage of American youth to serve in the military. One of the reasons we went to the all-volunteer force simply was demographics. We did not need everybody, and we never figured out a good way to decide who shall serve when not all shall serve. Always during the Cold War, we were mindful of uh, the uh, mandates or the, the ideas of the last mili career military person to sit in the White House, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, who said, beware the dangers of the military-industrial complex and don't forget the great equation, which was that national security is a combination not only of uh, military strength but economic strength. And so budget realities always intruded. Uh, the defense budget began to go down, not just when Gorbachev came in, but when Graham, Rudman, Hollings passed their budget deficit reduction. In fact, we used to kid in the Pentagon and sort of call it Graham, Rudman, Gorbachev, which in effect was driving, uh, dri dri driving defense down. As a result of the fall of the Berlin Wall, a consensus emerged uh, about a year ago in the Budget Summit Agreement that defense would be cut 25 percent between 90 and, and 95. The question becomes really now what happens in light of what's happened in the Soviet Union and also our own worsening uh, budget uh, situation. It seems to me that one ought to begin planning now to cut defense by about 50 percent between now and the, and the end of the decade. And if you structure it right, it can more than provide for the security uh, that the United States needs. Now, a lot of people will say, now, wait a second, what happened to the situation in the Gulf? Well, the fact of the matter is, when we uh, fought in, in the Gulf, we sent about 20 percent of our active duty force and about 15 percent of our total force, because this basically was a force built to deal with the Soviet Union. Now, in terms of the military force that you want, you have to have a number of characteristics. You have to have strategic nuclear deterrence. Obviously, I think you can get it down to no more than 1,000 warheads on each side. Your conventional forces have to be flexible. They need a wide range of capabilities. We no longer need to build every weapon system main, uh, and, and give it, if you will, a Soviet test, whether it could stand up in high intensive war against the Soviets. And they have to be mobile. They have to be uh, to, to get there. Fortunately, in the Gulf, we had about five and a half months to get ready for war, but uh, we do need more, more mobility. 
uh, we need to be able to reconstitute, which means you need a reserve force and you need the industrial capacity because, as our other speakers have pointed out, it's a very unstable world. Things could change, but the one thing we do know is nobody can attack us on such short notice with such overwhelming military power as the Soviets did. Uh, over a year ago, Admiral Dave Jeremiah, who's Colin Powell's uh, vice chairman, said it would take the Soviets two years to reconstitute as a military threat. I'd say that's got to be at least five, year, five years now. You need to have a research and development uh, policy that keeps you on the cutting edge of technology, but you do not have to deploy in full numbers every weapon system that you develop. 15 B-2s ought to be enough for us to see how stealth bombers work, and nor would I go ahead and build something like 750 advanced tactical fighters. Uh, maybe one squadron uh, would, would be enough because there's no pressing need to get that high technology stuff uh, into the field. I do think we ought to keep forces deployed around the world, but the concept has to change. It can no longer be deterrence because if the enemy, as has been pointed out, is instability or chaos, uh, then you cannot focus on a, on, a, on a particular threat. I think the concept needs to be assurance or reassurance rather than deterrence. But rather than having 500,000 people around the world, I think we can get that number back to about 100,000 or maybe even uh, below a total. 50,000 people in Europe should be more than uh, sufficient, some 20,000 in Japan, maybe 10,000 in Korea, as long as Kim Il-sung is alive, and he must be about 90 or 100 years old now, but nonetheless, he still seems to be, uh, to be, to be going strong, and the rest could be random uh, naval deployments to uh, parts, parts around the world. I would not keep combat troops forward deployed. I would keep combat support. I would keep headquarters support, because if you want to go back in, you need the infrastructure, which is something that we learned in the Gulf. And finally, I would only stay in areas of the world where people want us, and I would insist that they adopt the Japanese model, which is they share the costs with us. Uh, the Japanese, as you may uh, know, pay 50 percent of the cost of keeping our forces uh, uh, in Japan if, in fact, we keep NATO or the Europeans want us there for st stability and also enable them to spend less on defense. I think they ought to split the cost with us the same way with Korea and uh, if we keep, uh, keep forces in the Middle East. If you do that, I think you can have more than enough capability at half the levels of expenditures that we had at the beginning of, uh, of this decade, and I think it will also be uh, politically palatable. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. And now we can turn to uh, questions. There are two microphones, one here and one here. It would be most helpful if people would come to the microphones to ask questions. And um, if any of you up there would like to do so, I'd appreciate it if you'd come down and get by a microphone. We would prefer that the questions be questions. It means there's one of these things that looks like that at the uh, end of it. If you would like, you can direct it at a particular member of the panel, and uh, that person may choose to address it first, and then others can turn to it. So there's one here and one here. First, Ash Carter. Okay, I have a question for General Galvin. Uh, Jack, we've heard uh, actually conflicting reports, but some reports that seemed uh, consistent that um, all Soviet nuclear weapons have been removed from Germany, rest of Eastern Europe, the Baltics. Uh, that would leave nuclear weapons, uh, strategic or non-strategic, in every other.
but we might be able to have some kind of a protocol or something by which we declare even before we go into nuclear uh, negotiations on the shorter range weapons that we're going to get rid of the nuclear artillery on both sides, take it down to zero. I don't see any reason not to do that because nuclear tactical war fighting is passe to say the least. Uh, it's not something we intend to uh, do. And so we could use that to get started and then take the rest uh, in negotiation. Why negotiation and treaties? Because we need to be able to verify all of this and especially because we need solidarity if there is a violation. We can say, wait a minute, here we have the treaty and look what's happened. I think that's what we should do next. Uh, it would be very difficult for the Soviets right now to try to centralize the shorter range nuclear weapons. They are in almost every republic. There are lots of them. Uh, there is an estimate that it would take years. Some Soviets have said 10 years to do all the moves that would be necessary in the construction and everything else to centralize the weapons. If we could get rapid action on SNF and get uh, a, a great number of these weapons destroyed, and we could talk about residual and so forth as we got into the negotiations. Any others want to comment on this in particular? Yes, sir. The needs for food, hard currency, and supplies, medical supplies and all, have been, have been made public by, uh, for the Soviet Union, been made public by many sources. Uh, the Soviet Union apparently, in its current economic condition, is going to have to either ask for gifts or make trades with Western nations that have surpluses and have materials that they need to go through the winter. They have a surplus at the present time with the current needs of sophisticated military equipment. Uh, my question to General Galvin and to the others on the panel is why wouldn't it be a, a uh, sound position for NATO and its <coughs> members, including the United States, to say to the Soviet leaders and, uh, and the Russian leaders, and as they are, uh, let's make a trade that will uh, benefit um, the cause of peace and will prevent other nations, such as Iraq or anyone like Iraq, from buying for hard currency uh, some of your sophisticated weapons, the MiG-29s, the uh, something of, things of that character, and instead of just giving food food surpluses to the Soviet Union, which we they certainly clearly need for, to go through the winter. Why wouldn't it be a good policy for us to say, let us negotiate for some of your weapons that, that you might otherwise be tempted to deal to less responsible parties so that we can retire them from the world scene and the threat and trade for the uh, probable market value uh, and give you necessary food and medical supplies that you're going to have to have. We, otherwise, we're going to have to give you. Yeah. Wouldn't that make some sense? We have the, we have the question. I think uh, that might have some possibilities. One, there are a couple of things that I think uh, would cause that uh, not to be received all that well. Uh, one of them is that we just finished the CFP treaty in which we lined out for all the nations involved, especially the Soviet Union these reductions, which would be reductions that came basically to parity, which meant the Soviets had to make enormous uh, reductions to get there. Of course, what they did was try to shift things around so that they would not have to reduce new things and keep old things, right. which is what we did also. Uh, now, if we turn to them after we have them in the process of the reduction and the destruction of all of this equipment, which amounts to uh, many, many thousands of pieces of equipment, we say to them, we also want you to give up of this, I think they would see it, my guess is that they would see it as a kind of blackmail. Maybe they would feel they had to uh, do this. It certainly psychologically would be very difficult for them to accept along with all the other things that they have accepted as part of the last couple of years. Uh, so I don't know, I think it's something that could be looked at. but. Uh, uh, I'm just afraid also, that, I'm afraid of it being a desperate situation in which they're, they're, uh, they see that they have to have 
the currency, and therefore they'll sell. Well, we'll, we'll also hear from other members mm -hmm. of the, yeah. the panel on this yeah. subject, Madeline. It's possible. Well, I, I think on the surface it is a good idea for all the reasons that you have mentioned, but I think that there then become two timing and bureaucratic problems. First of all, I happen to be of the opinion that we need to assist on food and medicines quickly uh, because the winter is coming, and even though there are mixed stories in the press about some places having food, there are a lot that do not. And uh, we know that the unrest that might be caused would add, could just fuel further ethnic problems. So I think that it needs to be done rapidly, and I think that this kind of a, a, a buyout, or whatever you would call it, would take time. Then also, I think, knowing what we know about how bureaucracies work, even in countries that are functioning, uh, there is the problem that you're working with two very different kinds of bureaucracies, the military and then whatever the, the distribution mechanism would be, even if there were a centralized system. Um, and I think that you would have a very hard time working it out. I do think there is a legitimate concern for what you're talking about, which is that specifically in some of the republics uh, that want to be going their own way, they might be in desirous of selling them into the Middle East, et cetera. So I think that whether we do it as a buyout or not, I think we need to work with them very quickly for some kind of a regime to try to get some control over what is going to be obviously arms sales for hard currency. I think we should distinguish between such a bargain for large Western assistance, including currency convertibility, and food and medicine of an emergency kind. For if we were to put such a proposal to them, that is to say, no food or medicine unless you make this deal, would any of us wish to withhold the food and medicine if they didn't, which could cause the death of innocent children? I doubt it. Hey, let me, I think one thing is, is very important. The United States has got to take the lead in stopping the proliferation of arms around the world. One of the dangers that's happening as we cut our defense budget is that uh, we are arguing in order to preserve a mobilization base, we need to sell these arms uh, around, around the world. And in fact, the President has even asked that the Export-Import Bank be allowed to, uh, to finance some of these sales. It seems to me that if we continue that type of uh, a policy, we won't have any leadership role to stand on as we try and, and get the rest of the world, particularly people who are desperate for funds, uh, uh, not, to, not to sell them. Right here. I'd like to address my question to uh, General Galvin. Actually, it's two questions. Uh, what is the likelihood as we begin to uh, withdraw from uh, Europe and Germany in particular that there will be a groundswell uh, of uh, a sentiment to have the United States pull out even quicker uh, uh, as, a, as a backlash for us uh, uh, leaving, uh, leaving uh, uh, people unemployed uh, in Europe. And the second part of that, uh, I'd be interested in your comments uh, uh, on uh, Dr. Korb's comment, uh, uh, statement that we might be able to bring the force uh, in Europe down to as low perhaps as 50,000 by the end of the decade. Is that, uh, as, the, as the senior warfighter, uh, how does that set with you? Uh, for, me, the saucer, <clears throat> for the saucer. Uh, <laughs> Let me uh, say that I don't think there's going to be any backlash about uh, the withdrawals. In fact, uh, we, have, we will have some trouble with the same kind of trouble that we're having in the United States. We're closing installations in the United States. Uh, we're also closing them in Europe. The difference is that uh, we're closing 9% of the installations in the United States and 39% of the installations in Europe. That doesn't come out very much when the Congress talks, but in fact, that's true. We've already announced 200 installations to close and we'll be closing many, many more. But I think we're working well with the host nations, especially the Germans. They understand also this. They also don't uh, particularly uh, want to keep up the levels of uh, forces, non-German forces in Germany that they've had in the past. So uh, as, as we drop down to a certain level, they will, be, uh, they will agree with us that, that that's right. Uh, I don't think we'll have a lot of trouble. We'll have some local problems, but we'll, we'll be able to work through that. In terms of what Larry said about uh, 50,000, I really don't think that uh, 50,000 would serve our strategy. The strategy is that we are committed forward 
And because we are committed forward, we have an influence in shaping events in Europe. It's the only seat at the table that we have in Europe. If you commit 50,000 uh, forward, that would be seen as a token force, as a hollow force. And uh, if it turns out that you don't commit combat forces forward, then you don't, uh, you're not able to be in any way compared to other people said, we, are, we, by the way, will have a core committed for, the smallest core you can have is two divisions, and that's what we'll have, which is a core. The Belgians will have a core forward, the Dutch will have a core forward, uh, the British, and so forth. Uh, I think that if those nations are, are willing to keep up that commitment, and we decide that what we want to do is keep uh, the supply clerks and things like that forward, uh, it will be a different matter, and we will not have the same influence and the same place at the table uh, that we have now. And uh, as that happens, we will lose the strategy that has served us so well for the last 40 years. I don't think the next 40 are going to be like the last 40. I have no idea what the next 40, I don't even know what the next 40 days are going to look like. So I think we ought to keep a force there that will give us the capability to have a say in how things are shaped because whether we have a say or don't have a say, if war comes in Europe, there's no way we would not be involved in it. I would prefer to keep a force there that makes sure war doesn't come in Europe, which is about a force of, I say 150,000, that's a force that would make me comfortable. Sam Nunn says 100,000, Les Aspen says 100,000. The sense of the Congress has been 100,000. There's a bracket in there. I think that uh, we, I will probably in the long run uh, uh, not receive as a commander the forces that I would like to have. Uh, I'm trying to say with all the energy that I can that what you need to keep is a core on the ground, three wings in the air, and a modified and smaller sixth fleet in the Mediterranean. If people don't think that that's enough, then I'll command whatever you think. Uh, but I, uh, uh, I want it on the books that I said that wasn't enough. <clears throat> this, is, this is a lesson in civilian control of the military. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful lesson. Soviet is, is military, um, military equipment. The, they have already the Soviets, in the ANT tank scandal, they tried to sell tanks as tractors, and the Czechs who said that they, uh, they must produce, their, their factories must continue to produce, and so they decided to sell military equipment to Syria. The, the sense that they're going to continue producing for unstable regimes tends to continue. The fact that um, the threat is no longer the Soviet Union, but localized, uh, regions in the Gulf War, although we were working with the Soviets, we were still fighting against predominantly uh, Soviet weaponry. And then in the fourth case, with the, uh, the splitting of the republics, the military-industrial complex is perhaps less strong now than, you know, clearly it was a month ago. What policy initiatives can the United States do to support conversion in the Soviet Union to prevent the proliferation other than the obvious one, which is not to proliferate ourselves? Thank you. Take well, first of all, uh, I do think that we've got a problem <clears throat> to solve in this. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, and we're all thrashing around with these ideas, all of which have uh, the same basis, and that is how do we help out here, but how do we avoid uh, the irony of pumping money and support into the Soviet Union while it continues to produce uh, fighter aircraft and, and carriers and, and missiles that could hurt us? Uh, I think this is why it's at least partially why we've seen our own administration quite hesitant about support 
uh, economic support for the Soviet Union. Of course, another reason is if they don't have structure, how do you really support them? What, uh, we've already seen what happens when you pour money into a country that doesn't have structure. The whole history of Latin America has is, is shown us that, if, if not other places. I think that we are talking around a problem. The problem is that we do need something like the spirit of the Marshall Plan that we had after World War II. We can't kid ourselves about this. We have, if, if, if you don't want to say we won the Cold War, and I don't like that idea because I, I think that if the Soviets have turned down the road toward democracy and free enterprise, that's our road and uh, this is great, but I don't think we ought to crow about a victory. But uh, we can't step away from this now and say, super, they all succeeded, and now we hope they recover. Uh, the Eastern European and Central European countries, and especially the Soviet Union, uh, need help. And we're talking about little ways of helping. And there needs to be big collective ways in which the West helps the Central and Eastern European countries, or else we are in for big trouble. And uh, we haven't reached the stage yet where we recognize that the way we recognize things in 1945. Um, well, there, there are several aspects to this. First of all, Senator Nunn has, in fact, offered that uh, some assistance be given on conversion specifically. Of course, it would help if we learned a little bit about it ourselves here. So maybe we can learn together. But. Um, I think uh, I agree with the general in terms of looking at it in a comprehensive way. This poll that we did, I think, shows something very revealing. It's a little bit like a personality test where you're asked on the first page if you're an extrovert and you say yes, and then three pages later they'll ask you if you like people and you say no. We uh, tested and we asked, are you for the free market? And you get up in the 60% yes, and then you ask, uh, of the 13 following sectors, which of them would you want, state control or private? And out of 13, which included heavy industry, transportation, electricity, et cetera, the only one in which there was a majority for private was farming, and the majority of the majority were people in cities that wanted private farming. <laughs> so there is a way to go. Uh, also, I think in this poll, which was done, um, I think, in a very interesting scientific way by Times Mirror on this, they, we ask questions about basic concepts of uh, free market. Do you believe in profit? Uh, not a lot. Uh, do you uh, believe that personal ambition is more important than the forces of the state? A whole series of questions indicate that they don't understand how the system works. Um, and I think that what needs to be done, this is also true, by the way, on multi-party democracy, that rather than, and I hesitate saying this right here in this very place, rather than sending large amounts of money in, I think that what needs to be done is to develop a whole learning core of people, business people, um, and students, and Peace Corps, et cetera, whatever you want to call it, to go in and spend a lot of time helping them in specific things like conversion, which is sexy, or accounting, which isn't. And, uh, going through a whole series of things because I think, and I agree with you about a Marshall Plan concept, but there is no quick fix here. And Americans, we, whether people say they won the war or not, there is this feeling that it's over. And as far as I can see from the work that we've been doing and that you all know too, this is a very, very long process and one which will require uh, working on these concepts. And so I, have, I think we have to see it that way. It needs a total Western partnership. It's not just the United States, and it means going in there and doing very careful, very labor-intensive work with them. I think, I think one of the things we need to keep in mind here is um, we're broke. And we're really not, but we, we act like we are in terms of the amount of taxes we're willing to pay and the things that we, uh, that we want. And there's a shortage of capital in the world, and we are not able to play the role that we should. I mean, I think everybody agrees we need to send something to the Soviet Union, but we don't know where to get it. If you look at our initial response to what happened in Eastern Europe, I mean, it was very, very, very small. I, I think before it got to the Congress, uh, it was less than a billion, and then I think the Congress put it up to about a billion and a half dollars, and that's troubling. And we ought to ask ourselves whether, in fact, 
by being so uh, narrow in the short term what it's going to do to us in the, uh, in, in the long term. It's no accident that people are going after the defense budget to get some of the money. They go after it for the same reason that Willie Sutton used to rob banks. That's the only place that's controllable left in, in, in the federal budget. And I, need, I, I think we need to think, uh, think about that. And one of the problems we have is that the federal government has starved the state and local government so much that I think the people would be up in arms if, in fact, we tried to send money to the Soviet Union, even if we decided that they, they would need it. And that's something that we have to really come to grips with ourselves. Okay. I'd like to ask two separate but related questions of General Galvin and the panel. Uh, the first, if I may stretch the discussion a little bit geographically, um, is whether or not in light of the splintering of the Soviet Union in light of the Copenhagen communique's desire for stability in Europe, uh, ought not NATO and the United States be more concerned with what is happening in Yugoslavia? And the second question is, um, doesn't the Copenhagen communique's desire for stability in Europe uh, tend to, wouldn't it tend to make the United States reluctant to support the independence of some Soviet republics that seek autonomy? As far as Yugoslavia is concerned, I think that uh, we have the, the problem of a strategy that was aimed at the Cold War, which is now in transition, but it is by no means uh, complete, especially in terms of the psychological, intellectual acceptance of a new strategy. The strategy is what's called crisis management. It really means a strategy of stability, uh, and it's, it's going to have to face new questions. The first of those new questions uh, was one that I have been deeply involved in, and that is the, the disaster of the Kurdish peoples along the Iraq-Turkey border. Uh, that response, as you know, uh, did manage to uh, save the Kurds from a real disaster, although out of 450,000, we did lose 13,000 people. Uh, but we were able to not only get them down out of the hills and into camps, but also out of camps and assimilated, reassimilated in their original locations for the most part. That was at a time when we didn't know from day to day whether we would be back at war with Iraq because of all of this. And we had our own <clears throat> U.S. forces well over 100 kilometers into Iraq on the northern side doing this. This kind of situation, which is only partially what we would traditionally call military, is the kind of thing I think we're going to face in the immediate future. We may see mass migrations. Uh, that have all kinds of implications and, and the disasters that they cause and the human tragedy uh, that comes about. And we're going to have to react to that uh, in, in ways that are uh, an analogy of what we did with the Kurds. I think we're doing the right thing to let the elect the European community see what it can do, or at least it will develop the situation, if you want to put it that way. But I don't think by any means we've seen the end uh, or are near the end of the crisis in Yugoslavia, and I don't know where uh, it will go, uh, whether NATO uh, will respond at any time or whether the NATO nations will respond as a collective. Will uh, so I am, yeah, I think I am concerned. I think we all ought to be uh, concerned with that. Um, ask, tell me that the Soviet question again. What I was wondering is whether in light of the desire for stability that NATO has expressed, it might be reluctant to, see, reluctant to support the independence of republics in the Soviet Union seeking autonomy. Well, this, this comes back to the question of what stability means, and, and I don't think uh, I would agree that that's a concern. That's a good question, because uh, stability does not mean maintenance of the status quo. 
In fact, uh, attempting to maintain the status quo uh, won't give you stability in a lot of cases. So I don't mean by that that, that it's uh, status quo anti-stability. I mean that we, it's, it's the same as the, the, the Yugoslavia question, and that is we'll have to take each of these as they come. Our strategy, we, we have grown so accustomed over the last four decades to such a specific strategy where we count up all the tanks that the Warsaw Pact has and all the tanks that we have, and the strategy is almost like counting iron, and what are we going to do? And it, we think we know every single day of what the war would go like, and we all read Red Storm Rising and all that. Uh, I think that uh, this is not, that's not strategy. Uh, it's bean counting. And we are going to face situations that we can't predict and that we don't have a fully laid out plan right down to the last unit that might move in response to whatever it is. We're going to have to ride with these situations and see uh, what the art of the possible is and really use some uh, intelligent responses to these, to these very, very complex situations. Well. I just came back last night from Europe, and there's no shortage of worry about Yugoslavia in Europe. Uh, and uh, they would very much like to find a way to, at a minimum, produce a ceasefire. Uh, and the European community has been uh, noble in its efforts, and especially the Dutch, who are the, in the presidency of the community. And I think that if they could establish the parties to the conflict in Yugoslavia could establish a ceasefire, then I think that very quickly thereafter one could organize through one institution or another peacekeeping forces. What I think uh, the West shrinks away from is peacemaking forces, interposing Western forces between fighting Serbs and Croats. And if you wish to have a vivid projection of what that would be like, think of Northern Ireland with mountains. Sir. General uh, Galvin has suggested that by whatever definition, it's, it's a paramount concern uh, of NATO that there be security on both sides of, I assume, both sides of the, of the European front. Um, and Professor Blackwell has mused on how much more problematic the situation in Europe might be today had we not won the Cold War. And I wonder to what extent it informs, quote, unquote, our side's thinking of what occurred and the strategy that we face the future with uh, to consider that perhaps it wasn't a question of our having won the Cold War, but they're having lost uh, the Cold War by the implosive weight of, of a system that was doomed ultimately to fail. And the extent to which, uh, if at all, uh, NATO is prepared to deal with uh, the new face of the conflict in, in Europe, which without a unified, uh, discernible, Soviet-led adversary uh, might result in numerous, if not innumerable, flashpoints as various European, Eastern European countries become more independent uh, and as ethnic and regional conflicts that have been suppressed for at least 70 years begin to rise up and create controversies for, for NATO that it was not designed uh, to handle. And to what extent uh, NATO countries and our NATO uh, commanders might consider uh, that as the Soviet threat declines, a continued uh, full-fledged or modified full-fledged presence of NATO might bring out other adversaries that are even more problematic or intractable than Eastern European nations rising up in a sort of a a cauldron, such as um, uh, an increase in Middle Eastern-type 
uh, terrorist activities, for example, that the NATO alliance just might not, as a military force, be equipped or designed to deal with? Thank you. Bob, you want to go first? Um, in reverse, it's not my impression that Middle East terrorists think very much about NATO. So I don't see the connection. Um, and I, I believe, I mean, if I can return to this, uh, I think that I discovered that most people who think NATO should be a vital institution thought so before the events of August. And most people who were more or less willing to see it decline thought that was the best policy uh, before the events of August. And I think that on that, as with all the other ones I mentioned, a real rig rigorous new look is required. Um, on the question of did we win the Cold War, it's interesting the hesitance here to say that we did. Uh, there was not such a hesitance in the Russian White House among the reformers. The phrase isn't, of course, crucial. Um, our values won, uh, and uh, they won to some considerable extent because of the policies that were pursued by uh, that totalitarian government. Uh, I don't shrink back from saying we won, but uh, it's, it's not important. What's important, and I want to be prospective just to conclude on this, is uh, what my colleagues have been saying is that, you know, to be a historical sense, uh, perhaps you'll permit me, the United States is better at winning wars than it is at having the stamina after victory to try to ensure a stable situation thereafter. And uh, that seems to me to evoke a need in, in the West to first recognize the enormous consequences for us of various Soviet futures and to design a policy as robust as the one that the West followed in order to uh, make its contribution, if I can put it that, to the collapse of communism and the end of the Soviet totalitarian state. And we are, uh, in my opinion, the West nowhere near a sufficiently robust strategy now. I think you've got everybody interested here. Larry? <clears throat> when uh, Bob was reading the purposes of NATO, and I expected him then to say, well, we don't need it, and then he finished in his opening set and, and said, well, we do need it. I, I think we have to be uh, clear on what we're talking about. This was an alliance set up against the Soviet Union, the Soviet Empire. Uh, you no longer have an expansionist whatever there, and to argue that you need to keep this seems to me to be going in, in just the opposite direction, and I think that's why General Galvin and I have a disagreement on what you leave there. Uh, you, combat forces are great if you're going to fight somebody, and you, you, you have a pretty good idea of who that somebody might be, but I'm not sure. The enemy is instability. I don't want to be part of an alliance in which uh, they may be a part of the uh, part of the problem. I mean, if you take a look at NATO, for example, one of the members is Turkey. And, you know, it, what would their ideas be toward lots of the other things that are happening uh, in, in Europe? I think American troops ought to stay there because of the, the concept that Professor Nye, Joe Nye here, outlines in his book about soft power and co-optive power. I think the presence of United States forces because of the uh, uh, attitude of other nations in the world toward us enables us to exert a calming presence and, and, and to bring about a certain amount of stability. It would seem to me if we're there, the Soviet Union or whatever becomes of it would not have to fear a rearm Germany. Germany would not have to want to rearm because of the fact that the United States is there. And that is the, uh, I think, the, um, the benefit of having American troops around the world. But this idea that it's some sort of alliance against something, it, it seems to me that that's, that doesn't exist anymore. It's, NATO is about as inapplicable to what's happening in Europe as when Jim Baker, Secretary Baker, went to the Middle East before the war. And he said, well, maybe we could have a NATO, you know, here in the Middle East after the war. And everybody said, well, who is the enemy? Well, it seems to me you have the same type of situation now uh, in Europe. I think we ought to keep the forces there, but I don't think as part of this alliance. I think much the same way that we keep troops, for example, in Japan and, and in the Middle East if, if we're able to. 
Well, well just briefly, I mean, I think the problem is not so much what to do with NATO, but the fact that there is no security, overall security system. And to go back to the question on Yugoslavia, there's nothing there to, to deal with the very specific kinds of problems that are coming up. And as I said in my opening remarks, I think our uh, desire early on to preserve NATO, come hell or high water, prevented us from being creative about thinking about a new security system. And I agree with Larry, I think there are a whole set of different kinds of threats and we need to be examining what they are. I, for one, do think that the United States must maintain some presence there, uh, psychologically as well as physically. And I would want a security system that put us in there in some way. Um, and also normal, I mean, you would want to keep the Germans uh, who are now going to be the massive, most organized power there under control. And I think you would lay out what the issues are and how, what you want to deal with. Uh, the checks have called for the expansion of the crisis prevention center so that it does more. They're all, there are tidbits of this thing going there and I think it behooves the international community to not be so uh, totally consumed by preserving an institution which served us very well, whether you say we won or they lost, it served well. Um, and it's preventing us from some creative new thinking uh, in terms of new security systems. Okay. Well, I agree that NATO needs to change. But I still think that the principle of the wing walker, don't let go of anything until you've got your hand on something else, is a, is a good principle. Uh, and although NATO it was not formed for the future, uh, it is a good basis for departure. It's a, uh, it is, among other things, and as, as, a, as a soldier, I think I need to say this, it is political control of a collective military and, and a kind of control that we've never seen before. For 40 years, a force of 1.5 million military has been under firm political guidance and control. When did we ever do that before? Uh, that's not bad. And so it also uh, means that we have achieved something that has a relevance uh, to the future, not in its form necessarily uh, that it has now. NATO's got to change. It is drastically changing its strategy. Really, from a strategy of the full to gap to a strategy of crisis management is not a bad first step. And as we go down the years, I think uh, we can do uh, we, ca we can develop from NATO what it is that we want. I would think that the Rome uh, communique that comes out of that summit will go farther along the lines of that uh, little piece that I read to you about uh, interlocking uh, security structures and, uh, and security responses and relationships. After all, why not start from where we are at any given time? Uh, right now we have the CSCE, we have the WEU, we have the EC, we have NATO, and we have the UN. All right, let's put that together and see what each of those organizations can do and how they should be melded and what else needs to be created. And I agree that, uh, it, with Madeline that we really have neglected the question of what to do in Eastern Europe but mostly it has been because we do not want the Soviets to feel that we are moving into Eastern Europe, uh, but we want them to feel that whatever happens there takes their uh, security into uh, consideration. Larry's comment about maybe we don't even need NATO makes it more clear to me why he thinks we can come down to 50,000. I understand it a lot better now. Uh, and did we win or did we lose? Uh, I kind of think we won. I think everybody thinks we won. But uh, as Bernard Fall uh, said, winners don't seem to learn very much. It's losers who learn. So I'd just as soon say we lost and start from there because we've got a lot of change to, to make. We've got a lot of shaking of the system to do. And so if we want to say at least if we didn't lose, they, they didn't lose either. Uh, and we've got, uh, and, and let's not let what happened in the past blind us uh, to anything. And let's let's look at NATO as a name for something that keeps 16 nations together, 
And that's all. It's all the rest has now got to be started new. But uh, let's not give up what we what we have. I will apologize to the rest of you. We're going to take one more question. Here. Okay. Well, I'll be very brief. I have a similar question. I'll just give the uh, the screw another half term and, and press the question a little further. Um, given the widespread problem of uh, my my country being in your borders, uh, endemic throughout East Europe and, and some of the South Central republics, um, do you think that NATO is prepared to deal with these sort of out of area contingencies in that vast security vacuum? And should the Soviet uh, republics fragment further, uh, if Romania goes to war with Moldova? Uh, Heaven forbid if Bulgaria and Greece are at odds or uh, Turkey and Iran or something. Um, do you see one of the alphabet soup of NATO, CSCE, WEU, EC being prepared to do with this? Or can you imagine some security structure which would be able to? And even worse. Um, That's a big enough problem. Yeah. <laughs> I think so, that might be enough. Well, why don't we? Right. <laughs> I, I'd like to do that. <laughs> Here's what I think about it, really. Uh, NATO might not be able to respond. But that doesn't mean that, uh, that, that NATO uh, hasn't had some value in response to the crisis. Take the Gulf. Uh, it, NATO did not go to the Gulf. But NATO rules of engagement, NATO standing operating procedures, NATO training, NATO togetherness, NATO uh, 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 tactics, uh, it was all really uh, the, much of the reason for the success in the Gulf was, was NATO. I know, for example, I had to send 7th U.S. Corps, 73,000 people. And, and uh, this country wanted the Corps moved immediately. And so I just turned around to people and said, okay, this is reforger in reverse, let's go. Uh, and all the sergeants and all the others all knew what to do. And we signed all the, all the contracts with the ports, seven or eight ports along the North Sea, and the channel in a matter of three days, and we're off. We moved. We we signed contracts for 600 trains, and and started the movement. That was, to give you an idea what that was. That is, uh, that is 25,000 uh, tactical vehicles and 15,000 other vehicles that all have to move. Uh, so we, so NATO was what enabled us uh, to do that, even though it wasn't a NATO move. Uh, when you say, is NATO ready, for example, to take on all these uh, issues that might come up in the increasing balkanization of Eastern Europe? No, and neither is anybody else, neither is any organization. But what NATO is able to do is, is with a sense of solidarity, try to face those issues and decide what to do. It is a forum for discussion of that crisis, and maybe it uh, uh, is, is more than that in terms of the way it was for the Gulf. And I would say that not just for NATO, but the other organizations uh, have roles, such as the confidence building that we get out of CSCE and the capabilities that the EC has, uh, at least to the degree that we're seeing it, and I don't know how successful it will be or even if it can be in Yugoslavia. Just very briefly, I mean, we have been focused basically on military answers, but I think that uh, some of those flashpoints do not necessarily have to become military flashpoints. And what needs to be done is that the Western community or the international community has to begin to address itself to the underlying issues as to why certain people think that parts of their country are somewhere else. And very basic things, I think, redefining self-determination, territorial integrity, all those issues that we have been kind of saluting for the last um, 50 years and thinking through how to deal with an entirely new situation in Europe and the Eurasian continent so that we need to be thinking creatively across a whole series of uh, issues, keeping a lot of us in work. <laughs> I, I want to say one thing, and if you want to still call it NATO, have it do something else, I mean, that makes you happy, that's, <laughs> that's fine. But one of the things I think is really important for all of us to consider is that I see an emerging coalition between what you might call the left or those concerned with domestic needs here at home and the right concerned with us just saying, you know, let the rest of the world go, go on. And, and I think it was exemplified pretty well by Pat Buchanan's uh, piece that he had in the Washington Post a week ago in which he echoed George McGovern's uh, campaign theme, Come Home America. 
And it's going to be very important that we present to the American people exactly the reason why we are in Europe and what it, what it is and what we hope to accomplish and why we have to stay there, particularly after Europe 92 and the collapse of the Soviet threat, because if we're not very clear about it, people are going to say, as they already are, why are you closing bases in the United States when you still got, you know, forces overseas, and why is it uh, that we are not getting uh, money back for the forces we have. The subject of burden sharing was on the front burner the whole time at the height of the Cold War. You can imagine what it will be when now the, the, the Cold War is over. I think Larry's right that uh, we do need much more national discussion of our priorities vis-a-vis -vis rebuilding America and our uh, international obligations. And it's an important point, and I suppose the discussion will go on after this meeting is is concluded. And if you could imagine a very different kind of panel up here who were foreign and defense policy experts who'd have quite different views about how much money the United States should spend abroad. But I would say this with respect to uh, the, the future of the alliance. I, I don't think it's an issue, if I may say this, Larry, I don't think it's an, it's an issue that uh, lends itself to burlesque. Uh, uh, 70 million people died in the last uh, world war and uh, uh, millions in the first. I don't think that it, it's possible after a transcending historical event of the kind that's just happened to have a clear set of explanations. I believe it is impossible. What it is possible, I believe, to, to do is to say we're not sure what the consequences of this are of these events are. But until we have a clear idea, it would be a mistake to dismantle the Western institution, which has most kept the peace for the last half century. Thank you. Well, this is a, a beginning of a discussion on Western security in the changing Soviet Union that uh, will go on uh, far beyond uh, this year. It's a wonderful beginning. I want to thank the Institute of Politics. I want to thank all of you for your interesting and informed questions. I want to thank Bob from traveling all the way from the third floor, Larry and Madeline from coming from Washington, and uh, Jack Alvin from coming all the way from Brussels. Thank you. It was very, very helpful.